Good morning, church. It's good to be with you this morning. Um, I think I want to say a couple things before I read the text for this morning. We get into our sermon. I, um, I'm struck that. Uh, especially in the last several election cycles, things have felt elevated, and for a lot of different reasons. Um, And it does not escape me that I stand before you, and some of you are here, and you sense and feel uh, relief, Um. Maybe even a sense of righteous uh, uh, satisfaction. Um, And others of you come feeling um, bewildered, disappointed, grief stricken. And I just think we need to acknowledge that. Um, If statistics are true, uh, and we all recognize that, you know, statistics are, can be manipulated, but we know that, um, and I do not assume that that those statistics do not hold true for our congregation, that um, perhaps the majority of you are feeling relief. But I want you to stop to take a moment and to recognize that your brothers and sisters, especially your brothers and sisters of color, um, feel more vulnerable today than they did last Sunday. And I recognize that for some of you, you might right now start be starting to get a little angry. Like, how dare you? But if you don't understand why, then you need to have some conversations with your brothers and sisters of color. And I want to challenge you to listen. Not listen to correct, not listen to argue, not listen to justify your position, but listen. Because it's important. And if we are going to be a church, a community, that reflects the kingdom of God, then we need to recognize that there are differences among us. And that is okay. It's okay. But we have to learn how to love one another. And so, I recognize that um, this is without controversy, (laughs) as was just demonstrated. Um, And that's okay, too. We'll talk more about that in a little bit when we get towards the end of the sermon. So, let's just take a moment and pray. Holy Spirit, come into this place, or actually, more accurately, open our eyes and our hearts and our minds to the reality of your presence with us in this place. Help us to lean in to our discomfort. Help us to hear our brothers' and sisters' pain, whatever that pain might be. Help us to be your people and to live in the way of Jesus. Help us to bear with one another, especially when perhaps we don't understand each other. Give us grace. Give us compassion. 
We need you. Amen. So we continue this morning our series called The Impossible Promise of Enough. Um, And we're going to be reading just a short little section from Deuteronomy this morning. Uh, Deuteronomy 24, beginning in verse 19 through the end of the chapter. And it reads like this. When you reap your harvest in your field and forget a sheaf in the field, you shall not go back to get it. It shall be left for the alien, the orphan, and the widow, so that the Lord your God may bless you in all your undertakings. When you beat your olive trees, do not strip what is left. It shall be left for the alien, the orphan, and the widow. When you gather the grapes of your vineyard, do not glean what is left, for it shall be for the alien, the orphan, and the widow. Remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, therefore I am commanding you to do this. Please join me in prayer. Bless us this day, O Lord, with vision. May this place be a sacred place, a telling space. Where heaven and earth meets. Amen. So just for clarification, just so that uh, I don't get any unnecessary emails. This text was chosen... Uh, and as a part of this series framework um, long before the election. And most of you who have been around for the time that I've been here hopefully know me well enough to know that uh, that's just not how I operate. But you will also know that I do not shy away from the text. And so we're going to dive into this today. This is uh, one of those texts that is really, if we think about it, pretty foreign to us, pretty outside of our experience, right? Because I don't think, I'm pretty sure, I can say with a great deal of confidence that not one person in this room is going out to their fields and harvesting anything to put on their table or to bring to market. I mean, you know, I guess some of you who work at, you know, a particular company that builds big things that fly in the sky, maybe you bring some, you know, aluminum home to munch on or something. I don't know. But it But in that sense, this is just so far out of our experience, right? I mean, we just don't, we're not agricultural. And heck, you know, I grew up out on the prairie uh, in Minnesota, way over near South Dakota. And a lot of my classmates, families, were farmers. And even in that context, the way that the world works now is very different. And so that when, the, when harvest time, as it is now, was happening, it, it, you know, they weren't um, you know, taking that. It wasn't necessarily food to table, right? It was food to elevator to processing to whatever. And so I think we just have to take a moment and recognize how foreign this command is to us. And yet the commands and the... And the um, the idea behind it hasn't changed. So the first thing that we need to talk about is who are we talking about? The text that we just read, Deuteronomy 24, 19, says, when you reap your harvest in your field and forget a sheaf in the field. Let's stop there for a second. Um, now, I, uh, I would forget stuff in the field, because that's, <laughs> I forget stuff all the time. But, 
you know, I, I have, this, this just struck me as I was like going through this passage. It's like, um, how do you forget a sheaf in the field? Like, you know what a sheaf is, right? That's like when they're, when they're harvesting the, the grain, they're, they're cutting it down and they're putting it in big piles and then they're binding it up. And it's like those old fashioned, you know, pictures we would see uh, when we were in elementary school coming up to Thanksgiving, right? And it's like, I mean, I guess if your field was exceptionally large, you might forget a sheaf. But at any rate, the command is the command. Um, Moses, through, God is saying through Moses to the people of Israel, when you reap your harvest in your field and forget a sheaf in the field, you shall not go back to get it. It shall be left for the alien, the orphan, and the widow. So that the Lord may bless you in all your undertakings. So this is a covenant promise, right? You do this, I do that. But you will notice that this, there is, uh, this description is repeated three verses in a row. It shall be left for the alien, the orphan, and the widow. Verse 19. It shall be for the alien, the orphan, and the widow. Verse 20. It shall be for the alien, the orphan, and the widow. Verse 21. So who are the alien, the orphan, and the widow, and why is God so concerned that, we, that there is food left for them? The alien and the orphan and the widow were the most vulnerable in that society. The alien, or an, um, other ways that this word could be translated, would be foreigner or wanderer or whatever. We, might, we have all kinds of words for this in our culture. Most of them not particularly helpful. It is, the, it is the foreigner who lives in your land. And the command is clear. You're to care for them. You're to leave enough for them. In other places uh, earlier in, this, uh, in Deuteronomy, there are very clear instructions about taking care of the alien among you, not to oppress them, not to treat them unfairly. They were to have the same rights as everyone else. Now, I'm not going to get into immigration policy this morning, way too complex. And I recognize that, you know, that territory gets partisan real quick for some people. But brothers and sisters... We're not partisan. We're kingdom people. And that means that the commands of God are not partisan. The commands of God are the commands of God. And they're pretty clear. The orphan, that's pretty obvious, right? Who are the orphans? Well, the orphans are either without a, a father or a mother or perhaps both. In this particular culture, uh, the orphan is almost certainly referring primarily to those who are fatherless. Because without a patriarch in that system, you were vulnerable to be taken advantage of, to not be provided for. And so that's the same for the widow, right? Without a husband, to be a protection, to provide, they were vulnerable. And so God is very clear, especially in this, in this I mean, these, this short passage that we read this morning, three times in three verses. If, if it's repeated that often, and in, as any parent will understand, if it's repeated that often, it's perhaps that you mean it. And if that weren't enough, if you do a quick search of your Old Testament, 
you will find that there are, are at least 50 mentions of caring for the orphan, the widow, and the alien, or some variation of it. 25 times in the Torah, the books of the law. 20 times in the prophets. And 10 times in the wisdom literature and the Psalms. Now imagine this, friends. And I'm not trying to, to say this to, to uh, be provocative. But imagine the things that we in the evangelical church invest all kinds of energy and rhetoric and talk about that are mentioned nowhere near 50 times in the Bible. You know, it's challenging to think about that, right? Makes us a little uncomfortable. Or it should. I mean, I think we have to take seriously that God is not messing around. He's not just, you know, he's not just whiteboarding this. Like, well, maybe this will stick. I mean, this is a, a repeated command. Over and over and over again. Some theologians call this God's preferential option for the poor. That is, another way of saying that is that God has a special place in his heart for the vulnerable, for those who are at risk, for those who are on the margins. Now, the reality is that we might read these verses and, uh, and think, well, okay, but that, Pastor, that's Old Testament. That's Old Testament, you know, Jesus came to fulfill the law, yada, yada. But Jesus doesn't give us that option either. I was reminded as I was trying to figure out where to go with this, this idea that's so foreign to us, this harvest gleaning olives, grapes, grain. You know, when we need food, we go to Safeway, you know, or Trader Joe's, or wherever. And so it might seem like, well, that doesn't really apply. But what God is asking for us to do, I think, is twofold. The first is to recognize his heart. If God mentions that we should do something over 50 times in the Old Testament alone, uh, perhaps we should recognize that that's a reflection of God's heart for something. And that he's inviting us into that. Some of you will remember that in the Gospels, there's that scene when Jesus goes to Nazareth and he reads the scroll in the tabernacle or in the synagogue. And then there's some words exchanged, which we're going to read in a minute. And people get enraged and they try to throw him off a cliff. But what was it that Jesus said that was so shocking? Well, it reads like this. In Luke 4, 25 to 28, it says, But the truth is there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was a severe famine over all the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them except the, to a widow at Zarephath in Sidon. He goes on to say, There were also many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. Why? Well, the answer is in some of the adjectives. 
In the time of Elijah, when heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was a severe famine over all the land, yet Elijah was sent to none of them except to the widow at Zarephath in Sidon. In other words, what Jesus is saying is, he wasn't, Elijah wasn't sent to the people of Israel. He was sent to a foreigner, an outsider, someone on the margins. Jesus is saying, well, there were plenty of widows that in Israel that Elijah could have gone to, but God sent him to the widow at Zarephath in Sidon, to an outsider, to someone who was vulnerable, marginalized, at risk. He goes on then to say that there were, yeah, you know, a lot of lepers in Israel at the time of Elisha, but none of them were cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. Again, outsider. And what is the congregation's reaction? Is it, oh, yes, Jesus, we remember the many commands of the law and the writings that we should care for the orphan, the widow, and the foreigner, that we should care for those who are at risk, that we should care for those who are not like us, That was not the response of the congregation. The response was rage. Now, I wish I could stand before you and say that if Jesus were to appear today and make similar commands, that the response would be different. But I'm not sure we can say that. I'm not sure we can say that. Our call as followers of Jesus is to the margins, to those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for right relationship, for justice. Our call is to the poor in spirit. Brothers and sisters, wherever you find yourself on this Sunday, no matter which way you voted, the fact of the matter is Church, we have work to do. We have work to do. Now is the time to step toward those who are vulnerable and to demonstrate the presence of the kingdom with our presence and voices. The call of Jesus and the call of the gospel is the same that we should go to those who are in need. We should go to those who are hurting. We should go to those who are marginalized. And we should be about the work of demonstrating the presence of the kingdom in our cry for justice, for righteousness, right relationship, and for safety. And I recognize that I'm on... (laughs) I'm on thin ice with some of you right now. I know that. This isn't my first rodeo. I've I've been in this world for a long time. But it does not change the demands of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So my prayer is that the church will rise and respond to the call. 
Not the call of partisan politics, but the call to be God's people. To love justice. To seek mercy. To walk humbly with God. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that while we were yet sinners, you came for us. That while we were on the margins, when we were outside, that you sought after us. Jesus, give us the courage to step into the gospel call, to be your people, to stand with those who are in need, to love the foreigner, the widow, and the orphan, and to provide for them. Jesus, give us the courage to seek justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with you. Amen.